Hi guys, how's it going grade 10? Hope you guys are making it through. We've been doing this for eight weeks now. Um, a couple of you are going to have to step it up when it comes to getting your work in. Okay, you know I don't mind it if it's a bit late, but when I turn on my thing and I see half of you haven't turned it in, there's going to be problems, especially this close to the end of the school year. So, I know I haven't been able to get stuff back to you as fast as I'd like. That's going to change very quickly after Friday of this week because I will finally be done getting all my grades in from the 11th grade over to TCC, Tarrant County College, for my other work, for my other group. But anyways, but uh, that being said, for those of you who have gotten your stuff in, I'm very, very pleased with the majority of what I see. I said I'd talk today uh, just briefly about that last assignment, the one that had to do with Gatsby and uh, his psychoanalysis. This is where... Uh, they look at what would happen, say, if Gatsby was a real person. Now, I have heard some folks in the past say, why are we looking at this guy? Why are we talking about this fellow? He is not real. And that's a very valid point to bring up. In the simple terms, number one, Gatsby was written by a fellow named Mr. Fitzgerald. And every writer, even writers of fiction, when they build a character, those characters are based upon real people that the writers have known. Great literature, like The Great Gatsby, it becomes great literature because the characters in it, the lessons that are taught, they teach us universal truths about ourselves. So we can take a look at Gatsby. And one of the tests to see if he is a well-written character, if this is a well-written book, is does the character, does the person behave in a way that a real person could or would behave under the same circumstances? Okay. Um, a really good way to tell as well is to see if the story could be told different ways. I haven't seen it. I'm told there is a version of The Great Gatsby, simply called G, where it's about a fellow who decides he wants to become a rap hip-hop mogul, and he ends up trying to uh, get his old girlfriend back, and he goes by the moniker G. So it follows The Great Gatsby in that sense. So that story's been told many times in many different ways. Uh, three questions, though. The first three questions define, as Mr. DeFife put it, what is the difference between shame, guilt, and grief? Really quickly, shame is a person, it's what a person feels when they feel there's something fundamentally wrong about themselves. In Gatsby's case, what's fundamentally wrong is he's poor and he just feels inside like he deserves or wants to be something better. Okay? And he feels held back from that. Guilt is something a little bit different. Shame is where you feel there's something fundamentally wrong about yourself or your situation, and you can't change it. Guilt is when you feel bad because of something you are responsible for. So, for example, uh, a young person like Gatsby might feel shame because his family lives in a shack and all the other kids live in nice houses. Little uh, James Gatz has no control over that, and he is powerless to change it, so he feels shame. Okay. However, if you do something bad, like try to take a man's wife from him, sound familiar, Mr. Gatsby? Well, guilt is when you are responsible, you can change it, but you know you did something wrong. Okay? Grief is different from shame and guilt in that grief, you are sad or upset because something did not work the way you felt it ought to have worked. Okay, so grief in Gatsby's case, he really felt like he and Daisy were supposed to be together, but for whatever reason, it didn't happen. In this case, he ended up getting deployed as a soldier and she did not wait for him. Okay. She ends up marrying Tom, who is from her social class, instead. She regrets it, but we don't see her having grief to the degree Gatsby does. Okay, So what does Gatsby carry shame over? Well, we talked about that. He carries shame over having been poor and couldn't change that. Okay, And 
in shame, according to Dr. DeFife, uh, he is a, a psychologist, a psychoanalyst from Emory University. Uh, <clears throat> he says that basically it's linked to the symbol of eyes in the novel because when people have a certain degree of shame that they haven't gotten over, uh, they carry that and they are often worried about how other people will perceive them, how other people will see them or think about them. And so when Gatsby is doing the wrong thing, when Myrtle is cheating on her husband, when all these people are doing these various things, what or who is watching them? The eyes of God, the glasses of T.J. Eckelberg. So eyes become that important symbol in the novel. Okay. Does Gatsby carry guilt about anything? You know, if you guys found it, maybe I'll give you some bonus points. I couldn't find anything, so I would just say, no, Gatsby does not carry guilt about anything. Not even trying to steal a man's wife and break up a home. I mean, if you're going to feel guilty about anything, you'd argue that's probably going to be on the top of your list. But he doesn't. And that's a weird thing. That's a big thing about the idle rich. A lot of them do things that hurt people, but they don't seem to feel guilty about it at all. What does he have grief over? Well, you know, this is question D. Um, he has grief over something that he could not control that he felt should have gone in a different way. Okay, So for some of us, it might be the death of someone we cared about. Okay, It could be um, an opportunity that we didn't take advantage of and ought to have. We can feel grief over those things, uh, whether it was our in our control or not. Gatsby, of course, has grief over the fact that he and Daisy didn't get married, that Daisy ended up not waiting for him, but married someone else instead. So, to get full points for that question, you have to tell me, how does he link it to the concept of time in the novel? Well, in the case of Gatsby, Dr. Del Fife notes that when people have a huge amount of grief, one of the things that we human beings will sometimes do is we will almost kind of be frozen in time. Okay, So, for example, uh, one common grief reaction, if a mother loses a child, they will sometimes, one way that some mothers uh, will handle that, if the child was older, say grade school or above, they'll keep the child's room just the way it was when the child passed away. They can't let time move on. In the case of Gatsby, we see that time is a big thing. At one point, Nick says to Gatsby, you can't repeat the past. Gatsby says, of course you can, old sport. Of course you can. Okay. And in fact, it's a, almost a throwaway line in the novel, but you see it in a big way in the movie. At one point when Gatsby's trying to make that time back with Daisy, he breaks a clock, an old clock that belonged to Nick. And he says to Nick, I'll get that fixed. It's no accident. Those scenes cost about $14,000 an hour to shoot in movie land. And I'm not exaggerating, okay? So if you see something in there, it's in there on purpose. It's not accidental. So when he is trying to make that time back up with Daisy, he breaks time. He is trying to fix it, and it just doesn't work. Okay? And uh, this week we're going to be going in chapters 8 and 9, and we'll be finishing the novel up and getting into the fun part, which is the... I'll get there. Oh, the creative response. It's been a long day. You guys take care. Looking forward to seeing you in a little bit. Bye-bye. And... Bye-bye for real. <laughs> take care, everybody.